Um, good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's Lunch and Learn on improving mental health outcomes for children and young people in out-of-home care. Uh, firstly, can I introduce myself? My name is Stuart Moucher. I'm the Acting Executive Director for Family and Community Services Insights Analysis and Research, otherwise known as FACSIA. Uh, before we begin, in, and importantly, um, can I please acknowledge that wherever we're joining today's webinar from across New South Wales, uh, that we're all living and working on Aboriginal land. Uh, I'd personally like to acknowledge the First Nations people of the old area where I have the privilege of joining from today, uh, that being the Bedjigal people. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to all First Nations elders, past and present, and to future and emerging leaders. Uh, and I'd like to extend that respect to our Aboriginal colleagues joining us today. Um, a warm welcome to all our webinar participants, uh, in particular our speakers, who I will introduce to you shortly. Um, but I would also especially like to welcome our many frontline colleagues joining us today from one of our DCJ districts or one of our many not-for-profit partners or other government uh, partners. Uh, today, look what we're here to talk about. We know that mental health issues affect children from all walks of life, uh, but regrettably children in care or those at risk of entering care are particularly vulnerable as they often come from homes where there are multiple complex issues. And so this Facts Here Lunch and Learn will provide you with the insights um, on understanding and managing mental health needs of children in, in out-of-home care. Um, so now I'd like to take a moment to introduce all our presenters for today's webinar, um, and then we'll flow through their presentations without stopping. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have an incredibly full agenda, um, and as always, an incredibly impressive lineup of speakers for you today. Uh, first up, you will hear from Melissa Green. Uh, Melissa is Professor at the University of New South Wales in the discipline of psychiatry and mental health um, and is also group leader at Neuroscience Research Australia. Her research aims to understand the interaction between social and biological determinants of mental disorders from a developmental life course perspective and her talk is titled Understanding Mental Health Needs of Children Known to Child Protection Services Using Linked Administrative and Self-Reported Data. Uh, next we have Dr Nan Hu. Um, and we're very grateful for stepping in and presenting on behalf of Professor Raghu Lingam. Uh, Dr Nan Hu is a research fellow at the Population Child Health Research Group uh, from the School of Clinical Medicine at the University of New South Wales. He's an epidemiologist and statistician by training. Uh, his research focuses on the health services used by children and adolescents, in particular for those with mental health difficulties or who are vulnerable to mental health disorders, using administrative routine data collections. Uh, and his talk is titled Socio-emotional outcomes of children in out-of-home care findings from the Pathways of Care Longitudinal Study. Uh, next, we're very grateful to be joined by Associate Professor Rajiv Jaram, uh, who is the Clinical Director of Infant, Child and Adolescent Services at Southwest Sydney Local Health District. Uh, Dr. Rajiv has extensive clinical experience in inpatient uh, community and specialist infant, child and adolescent mental health services, uh, otherwise known as ICAMS. Um, for over the last 22 years where he's been a child psychiatrist. Um, he's also actively involved in research with over 20 publications um, and his special area of interest is children in out-of-home care with severe mental health problems um, and he routinely collaborates with DCJ in delivering innovative services in this challenging area. Um, his talk is titled Light at the End of the Tunnel, Managing Children in Out-of-Home Care with Significant Mental Health Problems. And last, but by no means least, we're grateful to be joined by Debbie Haynes, uh, who is an Aboriginal psychologist on the Lynx Trauma Healing Service team in the Newcastle Central Coast region. Debbie has just completed her master's in clinical psychology, uh, and her thesis is based on secondary analysis of the Lynx, uh, the Lynx data set, focusing on Aboriginal children and young people in out-of-home care. Uh, her talk is titled, The Efficacy of Trauma-Based Therapies for Aboriginal Children and Young People in Out-of-Home Care, A Journey Through the Lynx Trauma Healing Service. Uh, after all the presentations, uh, with the time we have remaining, I will lead a Q&A session. So can I please ask if you have any questions, uh, please pop them in the chat uh, while you're listening to our presenters, and I will put those questions to them at the end of the presentations. Um, a quick reminder to everyone that today's session is being recorded uh, and will be posted on the Faxia webpage. Um, and anyone who's RSVP'd for today's webinar will receive a link in the next week or so. Um, and before I hand over to Melissa, just one point that I'd like to make. Um, please keep in mind while you're listening to today's presentations um, about the support children in out-of-home care need, um, you know, to, to, to um, you know, need if they're experiencing mental health uh, disorders, is that 
thing we need to take away, especially for all our frontline colleagues, is this is why it's so critical that every child in out-of-home care needs to have a health plan um, and they need to be regularly monitored through the out-of-home care pathway program, um, yeah, especially if they have any history or emerging mental health issues. Um, if you want some further information, uh, we presented there were some presentations in the Lunch and Learn in June 29th, um, which you can access on, on the webinar page. Um, but with that, can I please hand over and go ahead, to, uh, Melissa Green. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that introduction. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, um, who are the custodians of the land that I'm on today in Victoria. I'm breaking some long service leave to talk to you today. Um, so I'm away from my usual place. Um, uh, I'll just get the slides up. So my presentation this morning uh, hopefully isn't going to be too familiar to those of you who have joined uh, some of the previous uh, Lunch and Learn seminars. Um, my work revolves around use of a, lo a longitudinal study of children in New South Wales um, known as the Child Development Study. And I'm just going to present to you a couple of key um, results from that study today that provide information about this, the, the mental health of children known to child protection services in New South Wales uh, with two different methods, using the linked health data in administrative records and also using self-report data from those children themselves. And so I'll just start by walking you through the method of the study briefly. This is a busy slide. Um, the centre of it is the timeline of our study. And you can see that children in the study were born in uh, around 2003 to 2005. And they began their first year of schooling in 2009, which was the first year that the Australian Early Development Census um, was implemented around the country. And so we set up this study to be able to follow that cohort of children who were assessed with the early development census in 2009. And we follow them via these just repeated waves of record linkage for both their parents and themselves to gather as much data as we can from health, education, justice and child protection systems to bring that all together and ask questions like uh, the ones that I'm going to um, show you the answers to today. Um, the study comprises 91,000 children in total, and that includes 87,000 or so who completed the AEDC. And then there's some additional children that we captured when we completed a middle childhood survey for this cohort when they were in year six of school. So it was in 2015, we tried to get as many uh, schools in New South Wales to help us to uh, administer this middle childhood survey in school time. And we did manage to capture 30% of the original cohort and some additional children who hadn't been in New South Wales when they started school in 2009. So there's a bit of a, um, a, a merging of the those two cohorts to provide the final number of, of 91,635 children that we're now following through to adulthood with these repeated waves of linkage. So I won't labour the methodology too much further. Um, I want to focus on results for today. And the first paper that I want to walk you through the results of uh, is one that was published in the Medical Journal of Australia uh, in first published 2019. And in that study, we've included 74,462 children in the state of New South Wales uh, for whom we have the full data available to conduct the analyses of this study. What's quite remarkable at the outset is acknowledging that nearly one in five children or 18% were known to child protection services by that age of starting school. And of those children, around 4% were diagnosed with a mental disorder. Um, sorry, that's of the whole population. 4% of the whole population were diagnosed with a mental disorder between the ages of 6 to 14 years, only within health records. Um, and so that's a... Um, when we looked at the association between being known to child protection services and the mental health diagnoses in those administrative records, 
there's a clear distinction that 9.8% of the children known to child protection services had at least one mental disorder diagnosis in that middle childhood period versus only 2.9% of children who don't have a child protection record who had a mental disorder diagnosis in that same period. So it's about a, um, a, a difference of around three where the mental health service use was, was three times higher for the children known to child protection services as for any type of diagnosis. The lower part of these um, infographics show you that in particular, the um, children known to child protection services were more than four times as likely to engage in self-harm in that middle childhood period or to be diagnosed with a hyperkinetic disorder such as ADHD or a conduct disorder. The children known to child protection services were also more than three times as likely to be diagnosed with an emotional disorder or a stress reaction, and they were more than twice as likely to be diagnosed with a developmental disorder. Now, this was the first study that actually went into the detail of the specific diagnoses of these children to try to get a handle on what services do they actually need. Um, and I'm going to take you a little bit further into depth of the, um, the more detailed analysis that we did, where we looked at the differences in diagnoses among those with different levels of child protection contact. And so you can see over in the left hand side of this slide, about 2% of the cohort had been um, placed in out of home care before school entry. About 4% had a substantiated Roche report as their highest level of child protection service. Around 14% had a non-substantiated Roche report and around 4% had been reported to child protection services for a, a, an issue that did not reach the threshold of risk of significant harm. So when we look at those four groups of kids separately and what their risk of mental health um, diagnoses are in the um, health records, you can see on the right hand side of the slide that the children who had been placed in out of home care have the highest odds of being diagnosed with a mental disorder. Uh, and this is an unadjusted model, so it doesn't account for any other things that we would normally think about, like socioeconomic status, uh, parental mental disorder. Um, so very crude associations, but it shows the, um, the the higher likelihood of out of home children in out of home care having a mental health diagnosis, but also that the children um, with substantiated or unsubstantiated rush reports are also um, quite significantly at a higher risk of developing a mental disorder in those middle childhood years. Now. Um, out of home care obviously might serve as a gateway to receiving mental health treatment um, in an administrative setting because there are pathways, as Stuart mentioned at the beginning of, of this session. Um, but nevertheless, um, this is an, a result worthy of um, thinking through what these children's needs are. And the final slide for this project um, shows you the odds of those different types of mental disorders, again, among the four groups, um, well, the three groups of children known to child protection services, whether they're in out of home care is they're in purple, whether they have a um, substantiated Roche report is the green bar, or an unsubstantiated Roche report as their highest level of service um, is in the red bar. Um, it's a busy slide, but again, uh, it's showing you these extremely high odds. They're up to around 10, 12 um, for things like conduct disorders, hyperkinetic disorders and stress reactions. And they are adjusted for other things um, like socioeconomic status, the child's sex, parental mental disorders and perinatal complications. So that's really stark and telling us the, that the types of disorders that children in out of home care are going to require help for in those middle childhood years and gives us an inkling of what's to come in their later um, adolescence and adulthood. But obviously these data are restricted to what's known in health um, records and so it could be very much underestimating the um, the, the mental health needs of children in uh, known to child protection services. And so the next study that I just want to show you quickly the results of used the self report data instead of administrative records um, for those who we had data from the middle childhood survey um, when they were around 11 years old. 
So there's 26,960 children in this um, particular study, of whom 21% had at least one contact with child protection services. What we did again was break the, the group up, those known to child protection services, according to their highest level of, of service. So on the very left hand slide here of this slide, those children who were placed in out of home care, um, at least 48% of those um, were reporting abnormal levels. So they're in the top 10% of children um, who are reporting difficulties in at least one mental health domain of the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. So if you're not familiar with that um, assessment, it has five subscales, um, emotional symptoms, conduct problems, hyperactivity and inattention, peer relationship problems, or pro-social behaviour. So it could be any one of those um, domains, but the children in out of home care uh, who had had an out of home care placement by the age of 10 this time um, were, you know, nearly half of them are showing difficulty in at least one of those domains. But if you look also across at the percentages of children in the other child protection groups, the risk is still quite high. The, those with substantiated reports, about 45% of them are reporting um, difficulties in at least one of these mental health domains. And even an unsubstantiated Roche report, 40% of those children um, are reporting difficulties in, in at least one domain. Um, so that adds to the literature, I guess, and the, the, the information to say that it's not just the children in out of home care that we need to be worried about. It's that anyone with a report to child protection appears to be at risk um, of mental health difficulties. And here are the particular um, types of problems within those SDQ um, subscales that I mentioned. Peer relationship problems are the strongest among those with out of home care placements um, and those with substantiated Roche reports. Um, but the odds of, of most of the other types of problems are also getting up there around the, the you know, one and a half and twice as likely as children who are not known to child protection contact. All right, in the interest of time, I'm just going to keep going and quickly show you one more thing. Um, a study that we did, which was based on analysing the costs of mental health care within admitted patients' data only. So it's restricted down now to one data set, the admitted patients' data, and children who are known to child protection services are represented here both in green in this um, graph. They're the kids in out-of-home care. The kids in red are those with any child protection contact and the kids in purple don't have any child protection contact. And that slide is showing you over the age from birth through to age 13 years, what are the costs per capita of mental health use among those three sets of kids. And you can clearly see spikes at age five to six when kids start school, things probably getting recognised by teachers age eight and nine, and again, 11 and 12, there are spikes of mental health care among those um, known to child protection services who are particularly uh, in out of home care. Um, and so what we've learned from this body of work so far is that children known to child protection services in early life are at higher risk. I think, you know, we knew that, but this is just putting it, um, you know, very much explicating what they're at risk of and when. Um, that the increased mental health costs associated with child maltreatment are evident at a very early age of development. And the findings here do suggest that school-based mental health programs might be beneficial for these children and perhaps shouldn't be limited only to those in out-of-home care. Um, all of the work that we do is available for you to look at on our website here. You can download our papers. If you have any problem, please contact me and I can send you copies of what you need. But we do provide a summary of all of our papers on this website, um, which makes it easy to kind of comprehend what everything's um, been about. And finally, I'd just like to acknowledge the many, many data custodians that contribute to this study and all of the colleagues that I work with who enable the work that I am privileged to present to you on occasions like this. So thank you very much. And I'll now hand over to my colleague, Nan Hu. Um, thank you very much for your attention.
Um, hello, everyone. And uh, can you all hear me? OK, cool. Let me just see. OK. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nan Hu, and I will present on behalf of Professor Raghu Lingam, who is not able to present today. I would like to first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and the elders past and present. Um, before my presentation, I would like to give you a brief introduction of our research team at the School of Clinical Medicine, UNSW. We are a multidisciplinary health systems research team involving three research themes, uh, in integrating care, priority populations, and the healthy start in the first 2000 dates. And we work across the health services of, in New South Wales. And I'm sure you all know this well, but I want to introduce a brief background for this research. In 2019, 45,000 children and young people aged below 18 years were in other home care in Australia. These children are at increased risk for many social and emotional outcomes, including mental health difficulties. Previous research has identified certain factors associated with mental health difficulties, including exposure to abuse, placement instability, and caregiver characteristics. characteristics. However, we need, we need more evidence on what factors has the most influence, and this will enable practitioners to better target resources to improve outcomes for children and young people in other home care. In this study, we use data from the Pathways of Care Language Children study, which is POCOS. Uh, this study is a large scale study of children and young people in other home care in New South Wales. This data is hosted by the New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice. This data covers a wide range of topics on child protection backgrounds and the care experiences, offering the first hand accounts from children, caregivers, caseworkers, and teachers. The purpose data include more than 4,000 children aged below 18 years who entered the auto home care system in New South Wales between 2010 and 2011. Among these children, more than 28,000 received final orders issued by the Children's Court by April 2013, and these children were eligible to participate in the POCOS interview. In total, nearly, um, nearly 1,800 children's caregivers give consents for interview with the POCOS, and 1,507 children were interviewed at least once. So the aim of our research was to identify children in autumn care who are at high risk of social emotional difficulties, both in early years after entry into care and persistently over time based on a range of factors. And this slide shows the specific factors we examined in this research. We only examined these factors at baseline assessment, which occurred predominantly within three years of children's first entry into care. As mentioned previously, we're interested in whether and how these factors are related to children's social emotional difficulties. And children's social emotional well-being was assessed using the brief infant toddler social emotional assessment, which is BITC, of children of one to two years of age, and the child behavior check, uh, uh, checklist, which is CBCL, which for those aged three and uh, to 17 years. They're both a standardized tool of completed by the caregivers. BC covers two domains, uh, which, is, which are social emotional problems and delays and deficits in social emotional competence. CBCL covers internalizing problems such as symptoms of anxiety and depression, and it ex externalizing problems such as rule breaking and, aggr and aggressive behaviors. Both of these measures can help identify children who have clinically significant social emotional outcomes, and we use the term social emotional difficulties in this presentation. The rest of the children identified as having non-clinical social emotional outcomes. And first, I want to show you the, the results regarding children at high risk of social emotional difficulties and early years after they enter into care. In total, 1,412 children who had a baseline social emotional assessment were included in this first analysis. The, the overall proportion of children identified as having social emotional difficulties was 21.7%. Our analysis identified two groups of children at high risk of social emotional difficulties based on risk factors. The first group consists of children who were three to five years of age at interview and lived with a carer who had a moderate to high level of psychological distress and who experienced four or more placements. And overall, 36% of this group of children had social emotional difficulties. The second group contains children who are older at interview than the first group, that is between six to seven and seven years of age. 
who lived with a carer who had a high, le high level of psychological distress and who was subject to any substantiated ROCH report before they entered into care and was subject to maltreatment involving emotional abuse alone or multiple types of abuse before they entered into care. In total, 39% of this group of children had social emotional difficulties. We found that age at interview and a carers, a caregiver's psychological distress were the two most important factors associated with children's social emotional difficulties predominantly within three years after they enter into care. And now I want to show you the results about children's social emotional difficulties over time. We analyzed social emotional assessments from all four POCOS interviews with the first interview between 2011 and 2013 and the first interview between 2017 and 2018. And in total, 335 and 45 children have social emotional assessments across the four interviews, and they were included in this study. We identified three groups of children with distinct and stable social emotional outcomes over time. We call the first group as resilient group, as denoted by the blue line. And this group consists nearly 30% of the study population. Children in this group had a CBCR total score representing better social emotional outcomes than the general population of children over time. The second group, including 40% of the study po uh, population, had the CBCR total score at the average level of the general population of children. So we term this group as normal group. The third group, consisting nearly 30% of the study sample, had the CBCR total score representing the clinical level of social emotional outcomes over time. We found that children with a caregiver who had a moderate to high level of psychological distress at the first interview were twice more likely to be in the clinical group over time than children in the other two groups combined. Additionally, children with more than seven precare substantiated ROCH reports and those who had experienced four or more placements at the first interview were also subsequently more likely to be in the clinical group over time. Um, in terms of the study limitations, first, we only an analyzed children's and the caregivers' characteristics at the first interview, and we did not consider the change in these characteristics over time. And second, the number of children with full social emotion assessments at all interviews was relatively small, and this limit limited our capacity to understand how certain factors, such as type of views, are related to children's social emotional well being. And third, our two studies are uh, subsets of the entire pop POCOS population. For example, the first study may underrepresent under adolescents aged 13 to 17 years of age and who lived at home for a longer period before they come into care. And the second study is only restricted to children who entered out home care at the age of three. Um, this research identified five factors that may predict children in autumn care who had high risk of social emotional difficulties. These factors once again highlight the importance of early intervention and the caring and nurturing environment in improving the social emotional well-being of children who were exposed to abusing environment. We want to emphasize that this, the current studies uh, should not take away from the need for individual level screening but rather adds a more nuanced risk profile of factors such as pre-care maltreatment and the placement experiences that can inform early intervention and the support for children in care. And our research has consistently shown that care, caregivers um, psychological distress is an important indicator for the social emotional difficulties of the child they care and therefore their psychological needs should be responded to with adequate support and interventions. So what's next and um, what we would like to work with government agencies and other potential collaborators to explore more interventions to supporting uh, mental health of children in care and their carers. An example of intervention based research is a solid study that Raghu was involved in. Um, so you can find more information about this study from this slide by Raghu and his colleagues in the UK. Um, and additionally, we are interested in developing more intervention based research aimed to improve health and development of children in the priority populations, including Aboriginal children and the children in care. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to pass on to the next speaker, Professor Rajan um, Jarab.
Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, I shall just get to the. Yes, very good. I do hope you're able to see what I am seeing, which is my first slide. Um, and hello, everybody. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I do acknowledge the traditional ones of the land we're on today as well. Um, and also, um, while well, presenting, this is probably a slight change of uh, change of tempo, as I'd be talking much more on the um, um, on my clinical experience and what we've done in some research here. Um, also, a number of people that I um, uh, have done some research with, including Roshin, Saskia, Ken Kumudu. Uh, some of them may not even be aware that they are they've been acknowledged in this uh, presentation today. But more importantly, um, all of the um, ICAMS or Infant Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service uh, uh, colleagues in Southwest Sydney, uh, my um, colleagues at ELVA uh, and the Sherwood programs that I'm involved in and I'll touch upon briefly. Uh, but I suppose the most important thing is, uh, as Stuart mentioned at the beginning, is are these children in our form care who, um, who who entrust their care in us um, or, or who, who we are involved in sort of supporting uh, and, and uh, either directly or through various other care teams. And I think always important to uh, keep that in mind. Um, well, as today's seminar topic is children out of home care with mental health problems and a typical service response, of course, is that it's too hard. It's really nothing much can be done about these kids. Uh, as you've seen in the first two um, presentations, um, you know, they, they are not going to um, do as well as their counterparts that are not in out of home care. Uh, it is too hard um, and 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 service responses sometimes are that it's not my problem it's a behavioral problem or a placement issue uh, and really nothing can happen um, and and from that from that i suppose uh, is is to sort of broaden our understanding uh, the blind man elephants is an ancient indian tale and i often um, use this metaphor to uh, describe what we're looking at um, uh, because depending on what our um, own um, background is how we approach the kind of difficulties and problems we might have many different uh, formulations or understanding of uh, what the major difficulties uh, uh, these children have at, 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 a, at a point in time or these service systems have um, and and yet um, uh, it is sometimes very very difficult to get the whole picture uh, and to help the child uh, um, uh, in, a, in a in a more wholesome manner so what happens as a result, um, the, the child um, who is the elephant in the room uh, is usually the loser. Um, the child is um, um, lost or advantaged. Um, there's, there, there can be quite a lot of infighting among professionals. Um, but, but taking a step back, it's important to remember these children um, often have uh, a number of different issues and to, and, and to be a bit re re reductionistic. Um, it's their developmental trajectories, um, so the kind of developmental problems that they may have, both uh, prenatally, genetic, and, and perinatally, um, which might continue to uh, be with them throughout their lives. And the impact of trauma, and all, almost 100% almost of these children would have had some kind of trauma or another. Um, um, and then and then the onset of mental health difficulties on top of it um, and all of these three um, interacting with the placement and uh, primary attachment difficulties and systemic chaos that surrounds them so so this this combination really is is you know puts them at very significant um, risk and it's important to understand uh, and 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 perhaps tease out these different straits uh, and, and there are disadvantages. I'm not going to labor the point anymore um, than it already has has been said. Um, um, children out of home care have, you know, as adults um, or even low, uh, later um, adolescents and adults uh, have significant increased risk of developing significant mental illnesses, substance use, criminal offending, lower education, achievement in higher age, um, much higher risk of premature mortality. Um, however, it's not all doom and gloom, and um, we've seen and uh, through our clinical experience um, uh, that we can make a difference, that things can be a bit better. Uh, the programs that I've been involved in is um, the Art Form Care team um, at Ingleburn, which is uh, in collaboration with uh, Southwest Sydney DCJ. Um, so it's a mental health program in, um, 
where we partner with our DCG colleagues. The ELVA program and the SHOWED program, which I will mention very briefly um, as well. Um, these represent the main sort of mental health and DCG um, collaborative services that provide specific services that provide interventions um, for children uh, in order to include with severe mental health problems in New South Wales and other services like the LINKS program um, and a few other services are also coming up and hopefully we'd see more as the months roll by. This is just a snapshot of our team here at Engelbahn. Um, I, the reason I put up this, this slide is that it's a little bit different from usual camps teams in that in that we do need um, to work with DCJ and it, it makes such a big difference uh, having the caseworker involved um, uh, continuously as we also provide mental health support and care for this young per person and this and, and the surrounding systems. Um, and again, um, we are a small team, can't look after every child in our form care with mental health problems, and so we restrict ourselves to the most severe end um, where a traditional camps intervention isn't appropriate. So, um, so it's only for those kids who can't be managed by our current or regular camp services. So what do we do different? Uh, well, some of the things are, are, are very similar in terms of um, having regular case conferences, making sure we involve all the appropriate um, uh, uh, systems uh, uh, or representation from different services. Um, the assessments uh, that we provide could be individual, um, family, uh, where family is involved or, or, or foster care, um, and, then, and then the other service systems. And direct intervention could be in terms of advocacy support, psychosocial therapies, and um, also medication where appropriate and making appropriate recommendations and link up. All this sounds, all this sounds very, very generic, but really I think I think there are quite a few unique aspects um, in that we do need to learn to work in chaos. That that traditionally, when you look at most mental health um, uh, providers, uh, they would say, well, let the placement stabilize, let um, you know a number of different aspects of the Ma Maslow's hierarchy. Uh, be met before mental health interventions can be provided. But really, for these children, you can't wait that long. If you're waiting, you're going to wait forever. Um, so how can we also jump in and work uh, when all of these things are happening? Is there a good fit between the clinicians and 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 the clients? And and where do we see them? I mean, if I'm waiting in my in my office for them to come, I'd be waiting forever. They won't. They won't. They're not organized enough to come to me. So we'll have to go to them. And it's and it's been such a revelation being able to go see them and wherever they are. And having a true multi-agency collaboration, it's not one agency telling another or passing the buck, but working together and working with what these children develop. I mean, over time, um, as these children are, uh, for whatever reason, um, uh, taken away or um, 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 have, have some kind of a fracture uh, from what used to be their family of origin, um, that they develop over a period of time uh, another family structure. Some of it could be could be um, kinship, could be foster, or could be a service system, could even be a professional family, as I'd like to call it. And then, and then what about this professional family and what do we measure? So we did a very quick study comparing, and I won't labor on the study, very much compared kids that came to our service in Ingleburn versus um, the the young people that we were seeing um, in our regular camp services, and we did see, of course, that there was quite significant um, um, trauma, abuse, and neglect in this population. Um, we also found an, a number of differences in terms of diagnosis, and that was touched upon in a previous presenter as well. That those in out of home care tended to have a slightly different diagnostic profile. We also found that they were much more impaired, so the um, Honoska, which is a measure of symptoms, um, was was much worse in the children that we saw in our clinic versus the ones in regular camps, and their functioning was also quite impaired. So CGAS, which is a measure of functioning. But over time, we did find that with interventions on these points, uh, these lines represent six monthly points. So in about a in about a year's intervention, um, that their psychopathology reduced and their functioning improved quite a bit. There were also a number of other adverse outcomes, you know, in terms of um, risk of placement and all of those other things, parameters, there was a reduction in all of them as well. Um, now, um, that really represents, now when I come to this, so that represents our, our, our initial study, which has been published, uh, and also there are a couple of other studies that we are looking at 
um, um, also get, also trying to get some young person and carer perspectives. Uh, but I'll briefly touch upon the two other programs, and this is very much within the DCJ remit, um, the Sherwood and the Elva programs. Um, so the Elva program, uh, which is based in Parramatta, um, is a is a, is a is a multidisciplinary mental health team which is embedded within DCJ. So funded by DCJ in partnership with us, um, and and it does quite quite a lot of what we do as well, but uh, but on a much bigger scale in the um, in the statewide space. Um, um, providing consultations, assessments, interventions uh, for children out of home care um, with significant mental health problems, and and specifically targeting those in ACAs who are at severe risk of entering them. There's also been a pilot, for example, in the Hunter New England region, which has been quite successful, working with them. Um, an early trends point to high success rates. Due to lack of time, I can't really present that. Uh, data here, but a formal evaluation is underway and its expertise is well worth sharing. And um, I, I do look forward with interest how the team develops. For those of you who are not aware of the Sherwood program, well, it um, uh, again um, is very much a DCJ program uh, that I've had the pleasure of being involved with since its inception uh, in 2009 um, for, for, one, uh, for one almost unplaceable child. Um, and I was promised, you know, just one child, but it's now um, grown, grown to be a vibrant, um, um, and we have a good partnership with with, with DCJ, um, and and the main show house now expanded to multiple step down cottages as well, all within our district. Um, so so who who gets in there? So these are children adolescents who have got multiple failed placements. Um, they've been to hospitals, um, um, and that's not improved them. Uh, they've been in justice settings as well. And they all have a significant level of risk, self-harm, suicidal attempts, sexual risk, absconding, drug taking. So really no other program or no other facility in the state is able to provide for them. And really the Sherwood program is the last resort for these kids. So in the last 13 years, um, like I said, we do have a good partnership. About 50 children um, have, have passed through uh, and all children enter the program on, on individual Supreme Court orders at a number of different agencies, the Metro Intensive uh, Support Service, um, uh, the DCJ site, Quobus Health Education, all of all of us are involved in a true collaborative partnership to assist what what is possibly the most challenging uh, kids in New South Wales. And what we have found, um, this is the first five year data um, that I did a quick check on. Uh, so number of sort of critical incidents reduced dramatically after an entering Sherwood um, program and the ED presentations, admissions to mental health units and placement breakdowns disappeared. Um, it's not enough to have. I mean, we are just two or three programs that I mentioned. It's not not sufficient to cover the whole state, obviously. And so, uh, we've been partnership partnering with the mental health children and young people. So our Ministry of Health, who've been very very supportive, um, and 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 also the DCJ um, state statewide services, um, uh, in an attempt to try and do something um, um, statewide for these kids. Um, and and uh, I think the take takeaway message from from the work we've done over the last year is that um, sort of health, mental health, DCG and NGOs are, and education are essential but not sufficient on their own. So we all need to work together and looking to see, you know, with the recommendations how we deliberate and um, um, develop a strategy uh, that can work both at state level and also percolate down uh, to make a true difference for these kids. And that work is underway, so watch the space. I'd like to sort of um, finish in the next couple of minutes with um, what we have learned. So if you try to bottle up, bottle up and try and um, try and say, OK, so what what is it? What have we done differently or what what are the really the main things that we need to look out for? Um, one is that clinician or or case manager kind of ownership of the therapeutic initiative. We can't expect these children to be to be the ones taking the responsibility. We have to take the responsibility, and that's the first change we have to make. We have to be aware of our own counter-transference reactions. And now these children come with a lot of having suffered a lot of pathology, and they and they and they come and sometimes show it to us and our systems because because we are the ones that they sort of trust. Um, and so for us to be able to understand and work through that without getting caught up in it is hugely important. And we need to be consistent, um, consistent in terms of how we how we engage um, with these with these populations. Um, we need to have a very systematic care approach, including engagement with the professional care family. Um, we need to make sure that our workforce is trained appropriately. 
um, and that is hugely important. Um, and finally, we need to redefine our um, um, outcome by in the sense of engagement. In the sense we can't have the traditional while I did present psychopathology and functioning. We just can't have that as our our sole uh, measures of improvement. Um, that that outcome uh, in terms of how well they engage, uh, what their placement stability is, and so on and so forth. Um, I do I do realize I haven't um, touched upon very specifically with with our Aboriginal populations who are also significantly overrepresented, and that is something that we are uh, working through. It's in fact having an Aboriginal worker uh, on our team uh, has improved our understanding and delivery and engagement with these populations as well. And um, my final slide. I think I think while while it was a bit of doom and gloom to begin with, uh, we have shown through the last few years of work jointly. It is difficult, but it is really not an intractable problem. That something good can be done. Um, that a, that a thoughtful, collaborative approach can make a positive difference. And it's not all, all about throwing new money at it. It's it's a different way of working, uh, and that is hugely important. And and if we can embrace a new way of working and think outside our traditional models of care. Um, then a world of difference can be made. Uh, and I think it's worthwhile. This kind of an effort is something we ought to take because we do owe it to these unfortunate children uh, because they didn't really choose to be in out of home care. They are significant victims of nature and nurture. And we as uh, being privileged um, sort of uh, in, the, in to be in the position to provide some care for them, um, that is something that we should continue to do. And there are a couple of slides for references, but thank you very much for your attention. And I now pass you on to Debbie Haynes for uh, your final presentation for today. OK, thank you, Rajiv. Um, I'm Debbie Haynes, the Aboriginal psychologist on the Lynx Trauma Healing Service um, in the Newcastle area. And I'm just going to present uh, the efficacy of trauma based therapies for Aboriginal children and young people in out of home care. Um, this will be a published study um, and a journey through links. So, of course, I'd like to acknowledge our, um, Auntie Bronwyn Chambers and Auntie Laurel Williams, as well as the Hunt Aboriginal Reference Group, who continue to provide support and collaboration on our studies. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my ancestors of the Kanilaroi Nation and the Dark and Young Elders, past, present and emerging of the land that I'm presenting from today. Um, I'd like to give warning also to Aboriginal people in the room um, regarding the sensitive information contained in the following presentation. So the effects of Aboriginal policy, non-Aboriginal policy and colonisation has had a traumatic impact um, on Aboriginal culture, language, community, spirit and families, particularly non-Aboriginal policies which saw the forcible removal of Aboriginal children from their families and their country. The effects of these uh, policies continue today with Aboriginal children being 15 times more likely to enter the juvenile justice system and eight times more likely to experience substantiated child protection reports for abuse and neglect. In 2017, suicide was a leading cause of death for Aboriginal children between the ages of five and 17. So data collected by ABSEC in uh, 2019 show two in five children in out-of-home care in New South Wales identify as Aboriginal. And that figure infers that an Aboriginal child is nine times more likely to enter the out-of-home care system within New South Wales compared to a non-Aboriginal child. So we know that children in out-of-home care are the most vulnerable cohort in society. And being in an out-of-home care system compounds and adds to the trauma experienced by Aboriginal children, which further compromises their ability to parent in the future, resulting in more Aboriginal children and young people entering care. So Atkinson and the Healing Foundation recommend a holistic approach to trauma treatment, focusing on connection to country and cultural identity, community inclusion, prevention, restoration where necessary, and alignment with current trauma-informed research. They also propose that future research should also consider the cultural identity of the clinician. So in 2015, David Tune was commissioned by the New South Wales government to conduct, conduct an independent review of the outer home care system within New South Wales. And this review concluded that the current system was unsustainable and ineffective. Uh, Tune recommended that the establishment of a trauma treatment service, um, which needed a focus on culture was to be established. And as such, uh, two multidisciplinary links teams um, were set up over the Hunter Central Coast area and the Penrith Blue Mountains area. 
and they consist of an Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal psychologist, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal occupational therapist, speech pathologist, and our psychiatry service. Uh, we are now um, setting up in the Orange area and we are established in the Illawarra area as well. So, um, to date, the Lynx cohort identify um, as Aboriginal being 50% of that cohort and our protocols and resources are adapted to suit Aboriginal children with a focus on the social and emotional wellbeing framework. Um, psychologists deliver four evidence-based uh, interventions, parent-child interaction therapy, um, eye movement desensitisation and reprocessing, trauma-focused CBT and the Tuning Into program. And out of the three evaluation reports conducted by the Parenting Research Centre, um, the outcome showed significant, significant positive effects on wellbeing of children and young people with uh, no significant effect on treatment outcomes for Aboriginal children. So our um, study was a secondary analysis of existing data co um, collected within the LINCS program. And uh, our aims were to add to the research question proposed by Atkinson and the Healing Foundation. So we aim to investigate which of the five psychological interventions was more successful with Aboriginal children. Um, we aim to examine if there was a difference within those successful interventions between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children. And we aim to investigate if there was an interaction um, that occurs between the cultural identity of the clinician and the cultural identity of the child. Um, the current program um, or our project is of high significance, um, given that there is sparse um, peer related literature regarding what trauma interventions work with Aboriginal children and young people in out of home care. Um, of course, Aboriginal children in out of home care are one of the most vulnerable cohorts in society. And what we know is that the LINCS data set is the large quant largest quantitative data set in New South Wales, possibly nationwide and possibly worldwide. We didn't find anything like our data set within our research. So there were 400 and, uh, 544 referrals accepted into the LINCS program between October 2017 and August of 2020. Um, out of that, there was 159 assessment completers. 77 were Aboriginal and 82 non-Aboriginal children. So that meant that they didn't have to actually complete the whole program. It just meant they got a service uh, from the LINCS program and that pre and post measures were done by the carers. So we measured the differences between the five um, interventions the LINCS clinicians deliver. And our measures were the trauma symptom checklist for young children and the trauma symptom checklist for children for our trauma symptoms and the strengths and difficulties questionnaire to measure the difficulties um, the child was currently experiencing. So these are our results. For the trauma symptom checklist for young children, there was a significant main effect for outcomes for both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children um, across the five treatments. And there was no significant difference um, between outcomes for Aboriginal children when compared to non-Aboriginal children. This is a um, little graph of our five treatments over Aboriginal children to see which treatment was most effective. Um, and what we found that there was um, no significant difference between the treatments. However, parent-child interaction therapy um, showed the largest positive trend there. So that's just the square. Our next two slides um, show the interaction that was found between the culture of client and the culture of clinician. Uh, we actually did find one and uh, surprisingly um, there was a statistically significant difference in outcomes for Aboriginal children when they were allocated to a non-Aboriginal clinician. So, and conversely to that, uh, when we look at this one for non-Aboriginal children, when they were allocated to an Aboriginal clinician, they had statistically significant outcomes. So that's something that we didn't expect to find. So for our strengths and difficulties questionnaire, um, of course, results showed statistically significant outcomes for both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children. 
um, and there was no difference um, between um, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children in, in regards to those outcomes. So um, the, res the results showed that both those, like all of the treatments were equally as effective for Aboriginal children when compared to non-Aboriginal children. If we move to the next slide, we see the Aboriginal children outcomes um, over the five treatments. Um, and this also uh, showed no statistical significant difference between the five treatments. And as we can see again, that parent-child interaction therapy um, has the largest positive trend. Over the next couple of slides, of course, is the culture and clinician. Um, so there was no significant interaction that was found between culture of client and culture of um, clinician on the SDQ. However, if an Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal child was allocated to an Aboriginal clinician, they seem to achieve large reductions in difficulties. So this slide actually shows some um, really interesting, uh, a really interesting journey uh, about an Aboriginal boy who was allocated to the Newcastle Lynx program. Um, and he was six years old. Uh, he was allocated to myself and our Aboriginal OT, and we utilise the social and emotional framework um, in regards to intervention and assessment for this young boy. So on, um, on the first slide there, uh, on the first part there, uh, we can see that he has clinical ranges across all domains, uh, particularly in uh, the PTSD symptom and sexual concerns domains. Um, and as you can see on the other um, part of the slide there, um, after the intervention of utilising the SUB framework, the post results were significantly reduced. Um, the young man still experiences positive outcomes to date. Uh, that's 18 months later, um, where you know we worked with the whole family, and mum actually rings me every couple of months to um, check in and let me know his progress. Um, so what she told me last time, our last phone call, was that he moved from a level eight reading level to a level 22 um, and improved significantly in his um, reading, as well as he attends school full time. He's very much a part of his culture um, when he's in um, school and in within the community. They've connected back to family. Um, so they regularly go to country and connect with their family. And of course, he has established now um, an exercise regime that um, she has to um, do every afternoon. Um, and, and the good thing about it is that he's also had a, a massive reduction in his medication that he was on when he was in um, with us. So this is the Lynx um, website that you can click onto and get all information about Lynx referrals. Um, there's little videos there that you can watch. Um, you can even refer that to, um, you know, caseworkers or carers, things like that. Um, and of course, our, you know, results support those recommendations um, proposed by Atkinson and the Healing Foundation in regards to utilising a holistic approach and, and possibly the SUB framework. And importantly, what we have discovered now is that um, the parent-child interaction therapy shows, shows the largest positive trend in results for both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children, but there is um, no literature at all found for Aboriginal children and parent-child interaction therapy. So this is this, um, the first of its kind. This, this study is the first of its kind. So I'll now pass it over to Stuart. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, and can I just take a moment again to thank uh, all our presenters today. Uh, Professor Melissa Green, Dr. Nanhu, Dr. Rajiv Jaram, and of course to, to Debbie Haynes. Um, look, as we anticipated when we set the agenda, having four such uh, significant uh, presentations was always going to leave us a bit short on time to keep us wrapped up in a neat little hour. So regrettably, we um, won't be able to host any Q&A sessions today. Um, if you do have any burning questions, feel free to just pop them in the chat though, and we will look to get back to people out of session. Um, can I please put in a quick plug to register for our Lunch and Learn coming up in August, um, where we'll be focusing on uh, foster and relative kinship carers, uh, insights and best practice to improve wellbeing and to meet service and support needs. Um, with that, can I say one final thank you to our presenters again for such incredible work uh, and such interesting insights. Um, and can I thank everyone for joining us today on our webinar for your interest in this topic, uh, for your work in this area. Um, and for the collaboration and partnership that we will continue uh, to support our, our children in out-of-home care. Um, so with that, a final thank you. Thanks for joining us um, and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thanks all.